Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video. Today we're talking about books. A few months ago I filmed a video about some of my favourite books of all time. And ever since then you guys have been asking me non-stop to film a books I've read recently video. And I've intended to do it the entire time but I've had to read enough books to talk about. So I've been waiting to like, I had a good collection of books. But I think I may have overshot it because I've actually got seven books here. So this is going to be a pretty lengthy video I think. So make yourself comfy. I say like all of my videos aren't at least 20 minutes long. I'm going to talk about all these books in the order in which I read them. So some of these I did read like three months ago-ish. Starting with the first one, The Girls by Emma Klein. I bought this book in May 2017 so I could read it on holiday. And I tried to read it and I just couldn't get into it. Um, and so I tried it again about three months ago. And again, I couldn't get into it. But I fought through and I made sure I finished it. Because this book was so hyped about, like it was on top of every single must read list, everyone was saying it was the best book of the year, and on paper it should be the kind of book that I absolutely love, it's about a 14 year old girl who finds herself in the middle of a cult, it's quite dark, and I just couldn't get into it. It's about 14 year old Evie, but I think the book's definitely more about her and her personal growth and like growing up than it is about the cult, but it's quite jarring to see this 14 year old girl in the middle of this situation. And she really is too young to understand what's going on, which I think is the point of the book, obviously. But I would prefer for it to be more about the cult than her personal growth, which is just a personal thing to me. It's loosely based, actually no, it's not loosely based at all. It is pretty much exactly based word for word on the Manson family cult, but she's just changed some of the names. Um, it's really, really interesting from that aspect. I just wish it was more about that than Evie. I really struggled to connect to Evie as a character. I think maybe I'm just too old to really understand the inner workings of a 14 year old now, or maybe I just could never relate to somebody like her. I think because I'm 24 now, I look back on teenagers who think they know everything and I'm just like, no, you are so young, even though I was the exact same at like 14, 15, 16 years old. But I think as you get older you have this kind of like insight that teenagers don't have. The scene is definitely set and it really does draw you into the world but it's so overly descriptive at some points that you kind of lose it and you forget what the actual storyline's about. If that makes sense, I don't like books that are like overly wordy, I like to get to the point, I like to talk about the characters and not the scene if you get what I mean. Um, but again, it is just personal, like obviously so many people love this book because it is so raved about but I just couldn't get into it. Like don't get me wrong, it's not a bad book at all, like it's a really good book, it's just not the kind of book that I'd usually go for. It was hinting at the dark stuff and the gory stuff but it was never actually talking about it and I like to talk about and read about the dark and gory stuff, obviously I do true crime. Leah on the Offbeat by Becky Albertalli is worth saying before I really get into this review that this is the sequel to Simon vs the Homo Sapien Agenda or Love Simon as you probably know it and that is one of my favourite books of all time. I love it so so much. So this had a lot to live up to. Of course it didn't quite live up to Love Simon, it's not a bad book again but it just wasn't as good as the first one in the series which is always the case. Leah as a character isn't my favourite. I didn't like her in Love, Simon the book. She was alright in the movie but in the book I didn't really like her. She's quite whiny and like she thinks the world owes her something is the way she comes across to me. So a whole book about Leah was gonna wind me up a little bit and she doesn't change in this book. She's still quite unlikable but I think that's just who she is as a person. It's an LGBT book which is always like a plus for me. It's about Leah trying to come to terms with her bisexuality. She has a massive crush on somebody and just doesn't know what to do with those feelings and so she kind of lashes out. She's moody and sarcastic and blames the rest of the world for all of her issues which is probably just standard teenager. But it does make it quite difficult to read because you're just like, for God's sake Lee, you're so annoying, just do what you need to do. Um, but again, maybe that is the sign of a well-written book in that a character can make you feel such real emotions. It's written in exactly the same way as Love, Simon, obviously it's part of the same series, but one of the reasons I love Love, Simon so much is it completely immerses you in this world. And this definitely does the same, like when I got to the end I was really sad. Not so much because this book was ending, but because I was so immersed in that world again and I really, really like the world that Becky Albertalli has created in this. It's difficult to find books in general about LGBT love, especially The Bee, but I think this is a really, really good one and it doesn't overly sexualise it, which happens in so many books, like bisexuality 
automatically equals overly sexualized and that just isn't the case and this book really does well at showing that. The next one we have is The Couple Next Door by Shari Lupina and again it says number one bestseller at the top so that's obviously why I picked it up because everyone was raving about it and again I wasn't overly impressed. I'm really sorry, I feel like this has been really negative so far. I promise you I've got some really good books coming up. I clearly had like a bad month with some books I was reading. I read this book incredibly fast. I read it over two evenings and it is a page turner. Like once you start it, you've got to finish it because you have to know the ending. So in that respect, like I read it really fast so it clearly wasn't that bad. It just got a bit ridiculous. I find crime thrillers either go one of two ways. Either you can guess the ending by the end of the second chapter and then it's boring from there on out. Or the author goes to such huge extents to try and create something different that it just gets a bit ridiculous. And I think that's what's happened with this. It just got silly. It's about Anne and Marco who leave their six month old daughter home alone whilst they go next door for a dinner party. And shock horror, the baby is kidnapped. In a bit of a plot twist though, they actually reveal what happened about halfway through the book, which is something that I've never seen before in a crime thriller. So props to Shari Lapina for that. But after the point where you find out what happened, it just gets weirder and weirder and it gets to a point where you're just like, okay, this just needs to end now. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. But again, it did keep me turning until the very last page, so something's got to be said to that. The ending is ridiculous, like, completely ridiculous. It leaves it very much open for a sequel, but I doubt there's going to be one, if that makes sense. It just, like, we could have done without the last chapter of this book, I think. I think... I would have been quite happy without it, it just goes past the point of ridiculous to like this doesn't even make sense anymore, why would you do that? Um, worth a read, very very quick read. Okay my camera just ran out of battery so sorry if like the background suddenly changed. But on a more positive note, I have the most wonderful book that I have read in a long time. This has probably gone up to like my top 5 favourite books of all time. The Miseducation of Cameron Post by Emily M. Danforth. You may have heard of this recently because it was turned into a film with Chloe Moretz. And the film is good, definitely, definitely worth a watch. Um, it's not as good as the book. The film very much focuses on the second half of the book at the gay conversion camp. But the first half of the book adds so much context that I found the movie was kind of missing something. I don't know how much I would have enjoyed the movie if I hadn't read the book beforehand if that makes sense. So The Miseducation of Cameron Post is about Cameron Post. When the book starts she's a 12 year old girl and she fancies her best friend, a female best friend called Irene and one day Cameron and Irene kiss and Cameron goes home that night and finds out that both of her parents have died, they've driven their car off a cliff. And Cameron's first thought when she finds out her parents have died isn't grief, she's relieved. She's relieved that her parents are never going to find out that she was kissing a girl. And then she has all of this guilt over feeling relief about that. And she just feels like God is punishing her for kissing a girl. And that's kind of the basis for the entire book. So over the coming years, Cameron grows up, she continues fancying girls. Um, and she's raised by her very religious Aunt Ruth. And then Cameron meets a girl who she completely falls in love with and Aunt Ruth finds out and sends her to a gay conversion camp called God's Promise. And to be honest, I much prefer the first half of this book, not to say the second half is bad in any way because it's still incredible, but the first half of the book is so real and raw and like you can really relate to all of Cameron's feelings. It, you just feel like you're there. Everything is just so... I don't, I don't know the word, I don't know how to exactly describe what the first half feels like, but like, you can pitch yourself in the situation that Cameron's in. The scenes, it's like set in the middle of Montana, in the middle of nowhere, so all the book can focus on is Cameron and her feelings, there's nothing else. The second half of the book, when Cameron's at God's Promise, is a lot more difficult to read. I found it really emotional at some point, and it's, it is really, really hard to get through but it's still absolutely brilliant. Gay conversion camps are something that a lot of people assume don't happen anymore, but they very much still do. Even though this book took place in the 90s, and a lot of you probably think that gay conversion camps aren't something that's still legal, they are. It is set in the US, and I think nowadays there are some like legalities around gay conversion camps, but a lot of the time nowadays they're just Christian camps. You just send your child away to a Christian camp, but they're like gay conversion camps in disguise. 
Um, so this is very much still something that happens today, which makes it so much more difficult to read. The ending is just perfect, the entire book comes full circle, and yeah, it's just wonderful. Please, please, please go and read this book. And once you've read it, watch the movie, it's very important. In a Dark Dark Woods by Ruth Ware, this book is gripping from the very first sentence. And again, I read it really, really quickly. And this is shockingly a thriller, crime-ish book that I didn't get bored of. I couldn't really guess the ending. I thought it was brilliant beginning to end. It's quite small, it was a very, very quick read and I really enjoyed it. And that shocked me because on Goodreads it got like mediocre at best reviews, so I wasn't expecting to like it and I really did. Maybe that's what I need to look for in future if a book on Goodreads has like just mediocre reviews, maybe I'll love it. The main characters are all from Reading, which maybe makes me a little bit biased because that's where I'm from, but it's not set in Reading. Most of it is actually set up north near Newcastle, some of it's in London. Um, it's about a woman called, actually I can't even remember her name, what? is your name? Nora. It's about Nora who gets invited to a hen party for a friend that she hasn't seen since she was 16, she is now 26, so she hasn't seen her in 10 years and she doesn't really know why she's been invited but her and her friend Nina go up anyway and things happen. It's very difficult to talk about this book without giving away anything so I'm going to be very vague about it but I feel like the setting of this book is very cliche but it very much works. Um, the hen party is at a house in the middle of the woods near Newcastle, it's all glass and it's just very, very, very creepy. Um, I couldn't guess what was going to happen in the end. When I got to the end I was kind of like, yeah, that's obvious, that makes sense, but I couldn't actually put my finger on it whilst I was reading it, which I think was very, very good. I really liked the characterisation in this book, like all of the characters were very well fleshed out and each of them was like somebody you know, like I can guarantee you know a Nora and you know a Nina, you know a Claire and you can just very much relate, it's very inclusive, it's got people of different like ethnicities, different sexualities and it doesn't like make us sing and dance about it either, it's just nice to have that included. So yes, I really really recommend, it's a brilliant brilliant book. I could have read this book very very quickly but I made a point of like putting it down every so often because I really wanted to like take it all in and really take my time reading it. This is They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera. You've probably heard of this. This is one of those YA books that everyone's talking about at the moment. And it's about two characters, Matteo and Rufus. And it's kind of set in a, I'm kind of hesitant to call it a dystopian society, but I suppose it is kind of dystopian. Based in today's time, there's just one difference. And that is that on the day that you die, you receive a call at midnight to say you're going to die that day. It's this company called Deathcast, nobody knows how they know who's going to die and to be honest they don't really make that a point in the book um, but everyone just knows if you're going to die you get a call around midnight saying to you you've got less than 24 hours to live. So of course as you can probably guess both Rufus and Matteo get that call on the same day. There's an app available to people who live in the last day who are called Deckers that is called Last Friends and you can sign up to this app and kind of make friends with somebody to spend your last day with, either another Decca or somebody who just wants to help. It's for lonely people. Both Rufus and Matteo sign up to this app and they find each other and they live an entire life together in one day. It's really sweet and touching and a little bit romantic. And there's no surprise twist in this. They do really both die at the end. There's no storyline about them trying to evade death or figure out how to stay alive. They both die. It's about them living as much of their life as they can when they've only got 24 hours left. This book isn't about death, it's about life and living and although it is a bit sad at the end as you would expect, it's not a huge tearjerker. It's about how to live your life, which I feel like I've said a million times. <laughs> it brings up a lot of really thought provoking questions like would you want to know if it was your last day on earth or would you rather not? Would you like to have that choice? Do you feel like you've lived your life to the fullest and what would you do with your last day if it was coming? And do you believe in fate? Do Rufus and Matteo die just because they've met each other? Or were they going to die regardless? I really would highly recommend this book. I put it off for ages because death at the moment is a fairly sensitive subject for me, shall we say? Um, and so I thought it would just really upset me, but it really didn't as much as I thought it would do. It was just breathtakingly beautiful. The final book I have to talk about is This Is Going To Hurt by Adam Kay, Secret Diaries of a Junior Doctor. 
I haven't actually finished this one yet, I'm about halfway through, but I figured I can talk about it because it hasn't got so much of a storyline to it. It's basically diary entries. Adam Kay used to be a junior doctor and he kept a diary and he's put it all into a book. It's just about his struggles as a junior doctor. He worked so, so hard. Like I said, I'm only about halfway through, but it's funny and it's heartbreaking at the same time. Like some passages that make me laugh so hard, I'm like crying and other passages actually make me cry um which to be fair doesn't take a lot but still oh my god can you hear all of that construction work going on outside i'm just going to carry on talking because i've already had to stop three times talking about this book because of the construction work so we're just going to carry on um yeah it's really really interesting if there's like things that you don't quite understand it gives you descriptions in the margin is this the margin footnotes footnotes so it gives you like little footnote descriptions which is really good very easy to read, you can just pick it up and dip in and out whenever you want. I sort of read a page or two before I go to bed every night. It's quite heavy at some parts, so I feel like you would want to sit down and like read it all in one go because you would probably leave feeling awful, but I really, really am enjoying it. It raises a lot of really important points about the NHS and how much we need the NHS, but the doctors and the nurses, anybody who works in the NHS is so overworked, they're not earning any money. And they do some incredible, incredible things. They're family members, friends who wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for the amazing work of the NHS. But the government is just slowly destroying it, which is horrifying because we have this amazing free national health service and it's just going down the toilet, which is terrifying. And they are all of the books I've read recently. Expect another one of these videos after I've read another six or seven books, probably around Christmas time. I hope you enjoyed this. I really need some more recommendations because I've literally got no more books to read after I finish this one. So please let me know what books you think I would like based on all of these ones. Um, I can't wait to hear all your suggestions and I'm about to go off and murder some people who are making all of that noise outside. So I will see you in my next video. Bye.